Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening to everyone out there listening to WCATradio.com. My name is Robert Madrigal, the host of this show, Know Your Faith, a form for those who know the faith, a source for those who would like to get to know the faith a.k.a. Unapologetically Apologetic. On this show, we talk about Catholic apologetics, and we are unapologetic about our love for Christ, our love for the Catholic Church, and they are one and the same. On tonight's show, our focus will be on the very Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Protestants object to our belief in purgatory. They say it doesn't exist because they don't, see, they don't see it anywhere in the Bible. Tonight, I intend to show two things. First, for the Catholics out there, the existence of purgatory is reasonable, and it is also biblical. We are going to discuss the theological implications of the existence of purgatory, and how purgatory is actually necessary for our salvation. And second, I will go over a biblically-based argument for the doctrine of purgatory. But that is only because if we fail to base our arguments on the Bible, we will not be able to convince a Protestant or Bible-believing Christian during a debate. However, I would like to make it clear that the doctrine of purgatory is not a doctrine that is based on the Bible. In other words, there was no point in time, no point in history, where the magisterium of the Catholic Church had to go through the Bible to come up with the doctrine of purgatory. However, we can find verses in the Bible that will back up a belief that we must be purified after death and before we can enter heaven. But before we get into tonight's show, I would like to start things off right with a prayer. And we'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come to you in great thanksgiving this evening for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ so that we may learn more about our faith for the sake of defending the faith. We ask that you will grant us the strength to explain and defend our faith with patience and charity and to see challenges to our faith as a chance to evangelize and to spread the love and peace of Christ to all whom we come in contact with and to do this through the example of self-sacrifice that Christ provides for us through his death on the cross. And we ask this through the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll, we'll end our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Like I said, tonight we are going to discuss the existence of purgatory. Now, one of the ways that I try to explain the doctrine is that heaven is perfect and we need to be perfect to enter heaven. Every Christian I have ever spoken with agrees that Jesus was the only perfect person ever to walk the earth and that Jesus lived and died in a state of perfection because he never sinned. Protestants object to our belief in purgatory for two reasons. Number one, because they can't find the word purgatory in the Bible. And number two, because they claim that there is no need for us to be purified after, after we die to enter heaven. 
And they base this on what they believe, that we are totally forgiven of our sins during our time here on earth. Protestants and Bible Christians alike have often told me that with the death of Christ, all our sins are wiped away once and for all if we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts as our personal Lord and Savior. And we can, we can accomplish this through one simple prayer. Now with that, we would have to believe that we all die in a state of perfection, like Jesus. On the other hand, the Catholic Church teaches that purgatory is the final purification after we die. And this is due to our need to be purified from the stain of sin. And those are the key words here, the stain of sin. Now, purgatory comes from the word purge. And purgatory purges us of the stain of sin so that we may be perfect to enter the perfection of heaven. Now, on this subject, there are many different items that I would like to talk about, and things could get really complicated. So I would like to attempt to keep things simple. And to do so, I will keep my focus on two major themes. The first one is fairly simple. I'd like to look at the reasons why Catholics should believe in purgatory. We're going to go over a lesson that will strengthen our belief in purgatory, and that lesson is based on reason, scripture, and theology. The second item is where it gets a bit more complicated. We need to address the Protestants' objections to our belief in purgatory. But I don't say that because I feel that we need to prove them wrong or because we need to win when we're in a debate with them. I say this because their challenges, they challenge our beliefs, and those challenges often lead to Catholics falling away from the church. So to address this problem, we must look through the Bible and make two major points. Number one, that purgatory is not a 20th century invention of the Catholic Church. The Old Testament talks about a purification process that we must go through after we die, or as the Old Testament states, on the day of our Lord. Number two, we will see if the Bible alone doctrine can be applied here or not. I've already mentioned that the doctrine of purgatory is biblical. We can find many verses in the Bible to base our belief in purgatory. However, I would like to make, state it clear. Purgatory is not based on the Bible. The word purgatory does not appear anywhere in the Bible, but can we find a description of purgatory in the Bible? Does the Bible tell us that we need to be purified after death, or does the Bible tell us that once we say a short prayer, we are saved and we can never lose that salvation? Do we need to be purified from sin after we die? Or do we all die in the state of perfection necessary to enter the perfection of heaven? When Bible Christians ask, why do Catholics believe in purgatory when it's not the Bible? It often leads even Catholics to ask if purgatory does not if purgatory exists or not. If the question of purgatory is to be based solely on Scripture, then we can base our belief in, pur in purgatory on a few verses that we can find in the Bible. But keep this in mind. Purgatory is a doctrine that is theologically sound, and it is reasonable, 
And that view is something that I do not base on the Bible. But if I had to, I could. What we Catholics must know first of all is that purgatory is a Catholic doctrine. I say that because when Catholics reject the doctrine, then they are more in line with the Protestants than they are with the Catholic Church. I feel that the only reason why it's important for us to talk about this doctrine is because Protestants have brought it into question. The Protestant movement of the 1500s began to throw some of our Catholic beliefs out of their Protestant churches. And the belief in purgatory is just one of them. And this could have an effect even on the Catholic Church. I say that because, as an example, I knew, a, I knew a deacon back home in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who told me, and I quote, the belief in purgatory is not important. You don't have to accept it if you want to be Catholic. Well, I'd like to stop right there and point out why that statement is so very wrong. So I'm going to examine the Catholicity of the doctrine of purgatory. To do so, I'll start with the question. What makes the Catholic Church Catholic? What distinguishes the Catholic Church from, say, the Lutheran? Or from some non-denominational, multi-denominational, evangelical Christian church down on 71st Street? Is it the buildings that we occupy? The parish office? Or the chapel? Well, the Protestants have those things just the same as we do. So do the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, and even the Jewish, the Jews. Excuse me. All the religions of the world have buildings that they occupy. They all have, they all have offices, chapels, and temples. So what makes the Catholic Church different from the Bible-believing churches out there? And what makes one religion different from another? Let's just have a look. The Jewish establishment rejects the notion that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah from the Torah and the Tenica. Christianity believes that Jesus is the Messiah from the Old Testament. Those are two opposing beliefs, direct opposites. The Quran tells Muslims that Jesus is one of the holiest prophets to ever exist, but not the Son of God. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the Quran says just that. Jesus is not the Son of God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Again, direct opposite. Now back home in Albuquerque, I met a Bible-believing Christian who looked me straight in the eye and told me, purgatory doesn't exist, hombre. Now the point I'm trying to make is that it is our beliefs that differ. So no, the buildings that we occupy are not what makes us Catholic. The buildings are distinctly Catholic while we occupy them, yes. Yet if a Catholic church is closed down and the statues and crucifixes are all taken down, the building can easily be converted to an Anglican church or a Lutheran church where the statues of Saints Peter and Paul might be replaced by statues of Oliver Cromwell and George Washington. Great military leaders, to be sure. But the point is that the buildings are made up of brick and mortar, wood and nails, sheetrock and plaster. It is the beliefs that we hold dear 
that makes that make us Catholic. To reject the belief in purgatory is Protestant. And the belief in purgatory is Catholic. Here again is another example of two opposite beliefs. So for a Catholic to reject the belief in purgatory means that they are taking up a Protestant doctrine. To accept it makes them truly Catholic. Now, I think with that comparison, the difference becomes clear. Opposing doctrines make different churches. However, in my experience, the question of faithfulness always comes up next. Well, I say that we need to be faithful to our Catholic beliefs 100% of the time. But let me explain. What would you think of a person who said that they only believe in God when they needed some money or some other material thing? Otherwise, God does not exist. Well, either you believe in God or you don't. You can't pick and choose when to believe in God and when not to. That's not a good demonstration of faith. Or how about this? You're getting ready to be married, and your fiancé tells you, I believe in being faithful to one another uh, 98% of the time. Well, it would be the other 2% of the time that would worry you. 2% unfaithful is unfaithful. And I would hope that every Christian would agree that in a marriage there is faithful and there is unfaithful, no in between. The belief that we can sometimes be faithful isn't being faithful at all. So we shouldn't treat our faith in the church any different. As a matter of fact, it might be even more important because we are talking about our immortal souls here. Oh, sometimes I'm Catholic and other times I'm Protestant. Depending on how I feel or if it suits me on a particular day. Personally, I would rather be remembered in history as a saint, like St. Thomas Aquinas, a doctor of the church who wrote the Summa and made a significant contribution to the Catholic Church, as opposed to going down in history as someone like Father Martin Luther, a man who caused the largest divisions of the church and Christianity in history. But getting back to purgatory, one of the things that always confused me is that Bible-believing Christians will tell us that purgatory does not exist. And in the same breath state, if it's in the Bible, it's correct. If it's not in the Bible, it's not correct. Well, for the Catholics out there, who are interested in learning more about the Catholic Church because of their faithfulness, let's go over why we should believe in purgatory. And after that, I will go over a strictly Bible-based argument which is meant to use when presenting an apologia and during a debate with Bible-believing Christians. So here we go. The, belief, the teaching in, of purgatory goes back before the canonization of the Bible in the year 408 A.D. and back before scripture that makes up the New Testament was even written. During the time that Jesus walked the earth, it's the name purgatory that is relatively new. Yet the doctrine of purgatory goes all the way back to what the apostles taught during the time of the apostolic church. And even before that, in Old Testament times. So we could say that we get the doctrine from ancient Jewish tradition, not just from apostolic tradition. And we definitely don't get it from Bible alone, which is a very Protestant doctrine. However, the Bible does contain verses that allude to purgatory's existence. 
that is written between the lines, so to speak. This is a clear case of reading the Bible in its proper context so that we can understand its meaning as opposed to interpreting the Bible, I'm sorry, excuse me, interpreting the Bible according to one's own personal understanding, which sometimes may not be very profound. And that is why most Protestants and Bible Christians reject purgatory, because the word purgatory does not appear anywhere in the Bible. But then again, neither does the word trinity, or more importantly, neither do the words Bible alone. Now this is because the word purgatory is a term that the Catholic Church coined back in the 15th century during the Council of Florence. The church did this because of the need to identify the teaching due, the, due to the questions that were coming up at the time. Now, the problem is related to the, the Protestant Bible alone doctrine. Also, there are a few problems that I could point out that the Bible alone doctrine can lead to, and two of those being, being number one, Modern Christians start to reject some of the original teachings of Christ. Now, purgatory is just one example. And number two, the Bible can be used to formulate new doctrines for a brand new church and even a brand new form of Christianity sometimes, according to foregone conclusions. So I'll state it again. We must read and understand the Bible according to its proper context. It's very important. For the most part, we need a priest who has studied theology or a properly trained Bible scholar to be able to do that. There are very few exceptions to that rule, and someone who goes by what they read alone and Facing doctrines on their own human understanding is not one of them. But for now, let's get back to the lecture at hand. Purgatory. Right now, I'd like to use an analogy that will show that purgatory, I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> purgatory is reasonable. And if you understand theology, it will give you an idea of the theological implications of the existence of purgatory. And this analogy is quite wordy, so please bear with me. Suppose there were a cotton farmer that came up with a brand new method of clean, cleansing cotton to the point that it is 100% clean. No blemishes and no stains in the cotton whatsoever. 100% purely clean cotton, and that's what he promised his customers. 100% clean every time. Then, one day, his shipping manager comes up to him and tells him, Boss, we have an order for 35 tons of cotton, but we only have 32 tons on hand. We are going to be three tons short for this order. So the boss hears this, and he looks at his shipping manager, and he accepts the shortage and tells him, Go ahead and get ready to ship the load. But just before the load is ready to ship, the shipping manager runs up and tells the farmer, Hey, boss, we have the three tons of cotton necessary to complete the load. The only problem is that we don't have time to complete the cleaning process before shipping in order to get it to our customer on time. So the farmer asks them, How clean can you get it? The shipper replies, 98% clean, boss. The farmer thinks about it for just a second, then he looks at his shipping manager and says, okay, take out half of what you have, 100% clean so far. Then take your stuff that is 98% clean and mix it in with the 100% pure clean stuff, and the customer will never know. Now, what did the farmer just do? Did he just purify the 98% clean by adding it to the 100% clean? Or did he just contaminate the 100% clean with the 2% blemish? 
Well, what he did was he just contaminated the 100% pure cotton with the 2% blemish. And that's exactly what the stain of sin would do if it entered heaven. Stain of sin cannot enter heaven, not even in the smallest amount, because of its imperfection. So unless you think that all Christians die 100% pure and clear from the stain of sin, then we must be purified from the stain of sin before we are allowed to enter heaven. And if we weren't, we would enter heaven imperfect and therefore contaminate heaven's purity. So just imagine a Christian who dies just a tad impure after spending a lifetime of living a moral life. Or even that this person had an immoral thought just seconds before their death. This person stayed on the straight and narrow path, living as best a Christian life as they can, and because of an imperfection or 2% blemish, or even a 0.00099% blemish, they do not enter heaven and get to spend the rest of, the, of eternity suffering. Now, if I were arrogant, I might say, well, I've, re- I've led a righteous life. I wouldn't need any purification before I'm allowed into heaven. My congregation and I would make it in no problem. Wouldn't I be leaving out the countless millions of people who are good Christian folks yet are imperfect and make mistakes as humans? After all, that is what Jesus died on the cross for, our sins, the mistakes we make as humans, even though, I'm sorry, <clears throat> even those that we make seconds before our death. Well, I hope the analogy that I came up with helps to put it into perspective. But no matter what kind of argument I come up with, there are always and there will always be objections to them. So if you're still unconvinced or maybe you just don't like my analogy, I could back it up with Scripture. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, but nothing unclean shall happen shall enter it. The context of the chapter is the new heaven and the new earth, and it's subtitled New Jerusalem. The next verse is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the latter verse comes from the Sermon on the Mount, words directly from Jesus. And we all know how humans are far from being perfect. Now, as far as I know, both Catholics and Protestants alike believe that in heaven we will be living in the presence of God and that heaven is the state of perfection. So imagine if we were standing there in the presence of God without being purified from the stain of sin first. Wouldn't that mean that that sin, or at least the stain of sin, can exist in heaven? Or at very least, we would be saying that we all die, and everyone in heaven dies, in a perfect state of grace and holiness. Anyone who would think about that for just a few minutes would have to admit that they are not perfect themselves. I've never met a Bible-believing Christian who claims to be. Without purgatory, we would be in danger of suffering in hell for the rest of eternity because of our imperfections. Now, I, for one, believe that God is much more forgiving than that. Now, all of these questions are deep theological questions that one will not be able to answer without understanding theology first. A lot of times, 
without understanding theology, you won't even think of these questions. And that's why Catholic priests attend seminary for before they are ordained. And it's also like I always like to say, the Bible without theology makes the Bible subjective. It becomes subject to your own personal interpretation. Well, I would like to hope that everyone out there listening rejects the notion that sin or even the blemish of sin would be allowed to exist in heaven. We must be 100% pure, like the cotton in my story, to the hundredth power and then some to enter heaven. Additionally, when we talk about the perfection of heaven, it is a perfection that we humans can't even begin to fathom. Earthly perfection doesn't even come close. Or I should say our human idea of perfection doesn't even come close. We are not even in the same galaxy, much less the same ballpark. Now that goes to show us that we should believe in purgatory. And not only that, but purgatory is necessary for our salvation. The necessary final purification to enter heaven. As for the analogy, it's one that I made up. It's a Robert Madrigal original, and I hope you like it. And I hope that it helps us to see that purgatory is necessary for our salvation. The only problem is that usually, in a debate, an opponent would give us less than two minutes, at most, and then cut us off mid-sentence. My story, my analogy, is a bit wordy and long-winded, just to put it mildly. And it's probably much too long to be of any use in a real debate with a Bible-believing Christian. So for that reason, I'd like to go over the second argument, one that we can use in case of a debate with a Protestant. And I'm going to start this off with a personal story of mine. It was very recent that I was watching a blog that was done by an evangelical Christian. The topic of the blog was on how purgatory does not exist. It was actually um, titled, Five Reasons Why the, purgatory doc- the Doctrine of Purgatory is False. Now, the blogger had done some homework on the matter, and he pointed out that purgatory didn't even have a name until the 15th century. And the way he put it, purgatory didn't exist until the Council of Florence. And that was in the 15th century. The truth is that the Council of Florence is where the magisterium finally and officially gave purgatory its name. But the blogger also made some mistakes that most Protestants do. He based his entire argument solely on the Bible verses that he picked out to support his own conclusion. It seems like he did this without even a basic understanding of theology. His conclusions were drawn, I'm sorry, his conclusions were drawn from the very Protestant doctrine of the Bible alone, or I should say the very Protestant tradition of the Bible alone doctrine. What he left out was the many Bible verses which support the belief in purgatory. Now, this show so far has been been a presentation of an argument that that can be made using reason, the Bible, and theology. But the truth is that most Bible-believing Christians might reject it anyway. For the most part, Protestants and Bible-believing Christians oppose certain Catholic doctrines. Usually the typical objections are based on verses that they find in the Bible to support their own conclusion. I have seen very well thought out presentations of why Catholic doctrines are false. Well, why not? That is what the Protestant churches started doing over 500 years ago, and that is what they do now. But once again, I must make it clear that the teaching of purgatory is not based on the Bible. 
The apostolic church of the first century did not base the teaching on what they read in Scripture. Now, that happened 1,500 years later. After the apostolic church, when the Protestants threw the doctrine out of Protestant teaching, they looked through the Bible to see what they can find, and they did not find the word purgatory. Nor did we get the doctrine of purgatory because the Catholic Church decided to look through the Bible to see what they could find or what we could find. And by the way, when it comes to Catholic doctrine, we could say that about all the exemplary things that Protestants object to. Here again, that is mainly because they base their objections on what they read in the Bible without even a tiny consideration of the theological implications of those objections. This means that beliefs can then be based on our own human understanding of what we read in Scripture. So what I think we should do is to look at the verses of Scripture that point us to a belief in purgatory. But before that, let's define what purgatory is according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, I do this because every time I've seen a Protestant presentation that goes against the belief in purgatory, that is how they started off with what it says in the Catechism. So we'll take a look. Purgatory according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Roman numeral 3, the final purification or purgatory. This is part 1030. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives this name purgatory to the purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the, pure, the punishment of the damned. End quote. Now reading that is to help baby Catholic apologists understand what purgatory is. I think that it is important to understand what purgatory is well enough to explain it to any Bible-believing Christian. However, since there are always objections, we must prepare to answer them. Now, while reading the Bible, there are three things that I feel are important to understand about purgatory. Number one. Purgatory is biblical, and I keep saying that, but I can't say it enough. Number two, purgatory is not just a 20th century invention of the Catholic Church. I keep saying that also, but also it's very important. And number three, the Bible, vi <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible verses which we will use to justify our, our teaching of purgatory are a perfect example of reading the Bible in order to understand the context of the letter or the gospel or whatever part of the Bible we are reading at the time, as opposed to looking through the Bible to see what we could come up with. As for number one, in order to show that purgatory is found in the Bible, just ask yourself, or better yet, during a debate, ask your opponent. If purgatory does not exist, how would you explain the following verse? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each one has done. If the work which anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is built, burnt up, he will suffer loss. So he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. <clears throat> 
Now, doesn't that sound a lot like the description of purgatory that we just read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Let's take a look. Bible. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Catechism. All who die in God's grace and friendship. Bible. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Catechism are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death, they undergo purification. Now that is as close to word for word as we can get. But not only that, the differences here are also just as striking as the similarities. The differences between the two are enough to show that the Catholic Church is not just plagiarizing the Bible. When we compare the Bible verses and the text from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it sounds like the Catholic Church is just trying to explain, in layman's terms, what Scripture is stating, especially for someone who hasn't studied theology. So let's just take a closer look to examine and compare the Bible verses, and the text from the Catechism. Bible. Each one's work will become manifest. Catechism. All who die in God's grace and friendship. Bible. For the day will disclose it. Now, I challenge anyone who believes in the Bible to tell me that the, that does not sound like the day, I'm sorry, excuse me, the day of judgment. Every Christian I've ever spoken with agrees the day of judgment is when we die and we are judged either worthy of heaven or worthy of hell. Now compare that to the sentence from the, catechi the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All who die in God's grace and friendship. Same thing here, the day of judgment. When we are judged and when we die. Next one, Bible. So he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Catechism are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification. Now I hope that the comparison is clear. If we ex examine the two side by side, what it says on the Bible and what it says in the Catechism, the two are almost exact. Surely, anyone can see that this comparison goes to show us two things. Number one, that the belief in purgatory is biblical even though the name isn't. And number two, the doctrine of purgatory is something that was written into the Bible, not a doctrine that was taken from the Bible after it was written. What we have to understand is that the Bible was authored by the apostles, and the apostles wrote down what they learned from Jesus Christ. The apostles learned from Christ. Then they taught the Christian communities. Then they authored what we now call the New Testament. Not the other way around. It was 1,500 years later when the when the Protestants opened the Bible and examined what they read so that they could discover their new doctrine. Now, I hope that doesn't sound too harsh, but it is a reality. Not only that, but there are other verses that we could point out to argue the existence of purgatory. However, we will find the same issue that we did with the first verse that we looked at. As far as I know, not one verse in the Bible will state, plain and simple, that purgatory does exist. But just like the verse that we've already examined, it is when we read between the lines that matter. Now, I've made this point before. We must read and understand the Bible in its proper context. The 
It probably sounds very repetitive in my show, but I feel it's very important. The task is much easier when we understand theology. Now, most priests study theology for about six years. And if we would take just a few classes in ancient Jewish tradition and writing style, plus a few classes on apostolic tradition, then we might be ready to begin to study the Bible. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the Bible deserves so much more respect than to take it and memorize certain verses for the purposes of debate or for an agenda or just to prove a point. Well, you might say that that is exactly what us apologists must do, but the difference is that the reason why we memorize the verses is to show that there is more to Catholic doctrines than meet the eye. And also because of the defense, the apologia that we have to put up when people use certain verses to question our doctrine. And besides that, that's what we are doing right now. We are studying the Bible to understand it in its proper context not just so that we could challenge someone else's be uh, beliefs and doctrines. So this next couple of verses that I would like to talk about come from the Old Testament. These verses will demonstrate two things. One, that purgatory is something that was written into the Bible, not something that was taken out of the Bible after it was written. And two, that the very Catholic doctrine of purgatory is not just a 20th century invention of the Catholic Church. If the Jews of the Old Testament wrote about it, then that makes it part of ancient Jewish tradition as well. Now the verses that I'm, talk that I'm talking about are found in Zechariah, chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. In the whole of the land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perished, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this one-third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say that they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Now with those verses, we might be tempted to think that what we are reading refers to the suffering that takes place here on earth, and that we are actually reading a prophecy of the coming of Christ from the Old Testament. But if you know anything about refining silver and gold, you actually take the silver or the gold and place it into a fire, corresponding with what the verses say. The heat from the fire actually takes out the impurities of the silver and the gold. That is the way it is refined or purified, if you like. What these verses are talking about is actual suffering. The fire is an analogy to suffering. And those who go into the fire just like the silver and gold are refined, are purified. Then we go on to read, They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say, The Lord is my God. When the suffering is over, those who went into the fire will be with him in heaven. This sounds a lot like what the Catechism of the Catholic Church is talking about when we read all who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven the Jews of the Old Testament wrote about a purification process that we will have to endure before we can be with God in heaven a purification that is necessary for us to enter the perfection of heaven. Okay, still not convinced? 
Let's look at Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. But who can endure on the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, I'm sorry, Levi, and refine them as gold and silver. And they will bring right offerings of righteousness to the Lord. Now, once again, we might be t tempted to interpret this as the suffering that takes place here on earth, and the prophecy refers to when the Christ would be born. But there is no denying that the language that is used in both these verses that I went over, excuse me, sound more like what we find in the book of Revelation. Now, besides that, the Bible speaks of all matters spiritual. When Jesus uses his analogies, I'm sorry, his, um, I forget the word. I'll just use the word analogies for now. And the prophets use this kind of language. We can be rest assured that what we are reading speaks of the world to come. Now with that, there's just one more point that I would like to make on the subject of purgatory. And that is that the New Testament also speaks of a prison, a spiritual prison where Jesus went to preach and where we pay for our transgression. The first verse that will demonstrate this prison is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirit in prison. Now what we have here is really undeniable. Even if we would find the temptation to interpret these verses as a time when Jesus preached to a bunch of guys who broke the law and got themselves thrown in jail. Now if you feel that is the case, let's reread the verses. For Christ also suffered once for sin. So we are talking about Jesus here. Being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. So this was not an earthly prison that Jesus was in preaching to the spirits in prison. This was after Jesus' um, crucifixion and death, and in which. The next words in the verse are, in which. Now, those are the key words if we question the state that Jesus was in when he visited prison. this prison. He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. He was made alive in the spirit in which Jesus proclaimed to the spirits in prison. We are talking about spirits in prison, so it must be a spiritual prison. Now, I guess if someone were to reach out as far as they can so that they can find an objection, they might say that these verses are talking about hell. But as of yet, I've never met a Christian or Catholic or otherwise, who believes that hell is a place that you can get out of. Every Christian I've ever met believes that hell is eternal. Once you're in hell, there is no getting out. So why would Jesus proclaim the gospel to spirits in hell who could never get out of hell? It sounds like, it sounds more like he was assuring them of their salvation. 
Moreover, I've never met a Christian who believes that heaven would be referred to as a prison, least of all in the Bible. So heaven is not the prison that St. Peter was talking about when he wrote these verses. Also, here on earth, God gave us our free will. And I would hope that every Christian would agree. God did not create us to live our earthly lives in a prison. So, since it's not hell, I hope everyone could agree, it's not heaven, and it's not earth, where or what can this mysterious prison be? Well, since, we move, since when we die, we move on to the next stage imperfect, maybe there might be a third option. purification process that we must go through in order to enter heaven might not be too far-fetched after all. Well, the name of the prison that we're talking about is not found in the Bible, and since sometimes us humans, Catholic, Evangelical Christian, and even atheists, are constantly questioning the Catholic Church and her doctrines, then maybe the magisterium had to give the name, had to give the prison a name for anyone back in the 15th century who had the same questions that we raise nowadays. Well, that's exactly what happened in the year 1438 during the Council of Florence. The magisterium of the Catholic Church decided to give the name purgatory since the name is derived from the word purge. The name was given to end the confusion and questions on the doctrine. But nowadays, it's the Bible alone doctrine that is causing all the confusion. And that's why we must talk about it today. But in our last few minutes, let's go back and talk about the prison that is mentioned also in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 26. Come to terms quickly with your accuser. While you are on the way, I'm sorry, while, while you are going to court with him, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. And that comes from the New King James Version of the Bible. Now let's have a closer look at what these verses are saying. Come to terms with your accuser or come to terms with someone you've done wrong to, while you are going with him to court. Now that sounds a lot like this is saying before you are judged of a crime, or before judgment day, that you be put in prison. There again is the prison. But we are put in this prison after being judged, because the verse says that the accuser hands you over to the judge, the judge to the guard. Then we'd be put in the prison. Then we get out of this prison after we've paid the last penny. This corresponds with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but it still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they go through purification. This prison is the verse that is talking about the purification. And since we get out of this prison after being paid, after paying for what we have done, we are assured of salvation. Well, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to have to um, stop here. And uh, I hope that was informative, and I hope it helps anyone who um, is struggling to understand purgatory. And I hope that does help in uh, apologia during a debate with a Bible-believing Christian. And it's like I always say, people who reject Catholic doctrines may not change their stance on any of our doctrines, no matter what we say. So the point is that I'm trying to make is I, I try to show Protestants that their objections to purgatory have no basis other than a misunderstanding of sorts. And... Um, now, before I go, I'd like to make a call to arms where I ask everybody to uh, pray, say a certain prayer for a certain 
um, thing this week. And this week I would like to call out to everyone out there listening to pray for the church suffering, and that is the souls in purgatory. But um, I would like to also invite everyone listening to come back next week. Same uh, website, same time. In two weeks from now, actually, uh, come back and listen to what I have to say on, uh, I believe I'm going to talk about the Eucharist in two weeks from now. So I'll be hoping to that everyone out, everyone out there joins us once again. So take care, and may God be with you in everything that you do. God bless. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.